I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my song, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to cow and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see, twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. We're looking forward to a great, great time in God's house. And we're looking forward to a wonderful message by uh, Brother Farrell, the man of God that God has sent our way. And we trust that each of you will uh, just open your heart. That's what I'm planning to do. I've been praying and asking the Lord to speak to me. And I want to be, not be guilty of thinking, oh, Lord, that was a good one for Paul Pritchard. So, well, I mean, Lord knows he needs it. But, I mean, and certainly he's a great target. But... We, uh, we want to, I want the Lord to speak to me. I'm going to ask Brother Pritchard to come on up here and open us in prayer, ask the Lord's blessings. And we don't do these just as token prayers. We really are wanting the Lord to meet with us and uh, ask Him to bless us. And Brother Pritchard is a great blessing to uh, my, myself, but many preachers in the area. And he happens to be a minister out of here, uh, Buffalo Ridge. And so we're blessed to have him laboring together with us. And so uh, after he prays, then Brother Daniel will come and give a couple of announcements just to keep you on track for the children's uh, sake, what they'll be dismissed in a little bit, and the, uh, the food tomorrow night, and the food. If you didn't eat before you came, uh, I hear that there are still some things after church. Now, I don't want you to hurry Brother Farrell along. Don't say, hurry on up. Up, hurry up, but uh, uh, but they will be serving some walking tacos after the service, so if you tried to get in here but you couldn't, uh, just let your stomach growl for a little bit during church, and then I got one before church, but I'm hoping nobody will notice because I'm going to slip back through after church, so don't tell anybody, okay? And I appreciate that. Brother uh, Paul, would you come pray for us? Ask the Lord to bless us tonight. Thank you, Lord. We thank you tonight, Lord Jesus, that uh, we can come to your throne. Yes, amen. Thank you, Lord, that we have access to your throne through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you tonight, Lord, that how wonderful, how marvelous it is to have our sins washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray, dear Lord, tonight in Jesus' name that you would help us to be, be honest tonight, Lord, before the throne of grace and help us, oh God, I pray as David prayed, search me, O Lord. And try my thoughts, Lord God, tonight. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be a, po a, po a people, Lord, that is willing to surrender our all for the service of God. Please bless this service. Bless our dear brother as he preaches tonight. Thank you for what you're going to do already in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Seated. Ooh. In case you didn't hear that, you can be seated. All right. Well, we are so glad to be in church tonight, and we want to welcome everyone to God's house this evening, and we want to say a special welcome to you. If you are a guest with us at Buffalo Ridge tonight, we're so excited that you were able to be joined with us, and if this is one of your first times here, we'd encourage you to fill out some information that's in, uh, in one of the pages in the bulletin. If you didn't get one, I'm not sure if uh, we had some sitting out there, but if you didn't get one, you can find one afterwards and uh, fill that out and get a gift on your way out, and I'd love to meet you there in 
that hallway. And uh, thank you for being a guest with us, Buffalo Ridge. But as Pastor said, just a couple things to keep you aware of how the week is going forward so that we can make sure uh, we know where everything's at, we know what's going on, and we can get right to the preaching as fast as possible. And uh, so that being said, I want to uh, let you know, in case you, you're a parent in here and you have a, a child five years old and under, their class is already taking place, and you could uh, slip out even now while I'm making announcements, but you can take them to their class uh, now or during the next song. Right over by the nursery is where the three, four, and five-year-olds are at, and then the nursery age children are in the nursery. And during the next song, Have Thine Own Way, the first through sixth grade, as soon as the song begins, you can feel free, first through sixth graders or uh, parents with you if you want to take your kids, but down into the chapel. And uh, during that next song, you can make your way there. And there's workers there that are excited about an opportunity to teach your children uh, the word of God as well. So we're going to have a good night together with that. It's going to be an exciting time for them. It's going to be an exciting time in here. And we're greatly looking forward to all of that. And then we want to invite you back for the next two nights. You don't want to miss any part of the revival meeting. And, uh, and if you're not able to be here, I, I trust and encourage that you would pray that God would work in a great way in the service you're not able to be here for. But I hope you're able to be here as God desires to do a great work in our church family and through our church family. And so pray to that end and labor to be here over the next two nights. Tomorrow night, just to keep you aware, uh, tomorrow night as you come, you can come here just like you did tonight and uh, be here 530, 545 and on. The food will be ready and uh, you'll have ba loaded baked potatoes tomorrow night. So it's going to be a good time together, fellowshipping one with another. And uh, there is certainly no doubt that we as a church family need to fellowship together. And so that is a major part of the reason why we're having it done this way, as well as make it easier on you getting here if you're coming straight from work. And so loaded baked potatoes tomorrow night would be a great time. And do not forget about Prophecy Night on, on Wednesday night. It's going to be a great service as Dr. Farrell spoke just briefly about it yesterday. And I encourage you to bring someone with you and pray that God would allow you to have someone here. And as I said yesterday, if you have guests here with you, if you have three guests or more, it enters you into the opportunity. Uh, to potentially be the one uh, to win a life application study Bible. And the person who has the most guests over three will walk away with that Bible on Wednesday night. So just a little incentive with that, but also just want to encourage you uh, to continue in that regard. So uh, just a few things just to keep aware of all of that as is going on with the church uh, this week, but I want to make you aware of those things. So we're going to continue to sing. So let's all stand together as Brother Rogers comes to lead us. First through sixth grade, you can be dismissed at this time. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, to Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence, humbly I bow. Thank you. You may be seated. strive to go beyond the reach of space to crawl beyond the distant glimmering stars this world's a room so small within my master's house the open sky 
but a portion of his yard. How big is God? How big and wide his vast domain? To try to tell, these lips can only start. He's big enough to rule the mighty universe, yet small enough to live within my heart. As winter's chill may cause the tiny seed to fall, asleep till waked by summer's rain the heart grown cold will warm and throb with life anew the master's touch will bring the glow again how big is God, how big and wide his vast domain, to try to tell, these lips can only start, he's big enough. small enough to live within my heart. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Brother Dan, for reminding us of that wonderful, wonderful truth, our wonderful God. Well, it's come to the preaching time tonight, and as Daniel mentioned, we just kind of streamlined a lot of stuff so we can get started right into the main event, and uh, we want to be kind to your time, but I want to give Dr. Farrell plenty of time as well, but then get us out at a good time as well. Also, I, I know the trap is that we let it linger on one night, and then you think, oh, I just can't do it, but we want you to be here every night if you can, and if you're not working, we want you to be here. We think that you'll be blessed every time. Before he comes, I want you to remember to pray for Miss Phyllis. Uh, she'll have knee surgery tomorrow. She's not here tonight, getting prepped for that. They'll go across the mountain and uh, have that tomorrow. So be praying for that. And then also there's an unspoken I want you to um, uh, be praying about. Uh, just when you go to bed tonight, remember, the preacher is up there. And uh, I want you to pray for this unspoken. Uh, one of our one, wonderful families at our church before, ch before service said, please have the church pray for an unspoken. And so I want you to really go to the Lord. He knows what it is, and uh, we want him to work in that situation. Dr. Tom Farrell is a wonderful blessing, and uh, we thank the Lord that he's dedicated his life to preaching the Word of God uh, for these many years. And uh, uh, the, we, we thought for a while that uh, his days of preaching would be, or possibly be over. But uh, you understand sometimes the Lord doesn't, uh, it's funny to say this, the Lord doesn't let us mess up his plans very often. <laughs> That's right. And uh, we may try, but uh, his plan is going to come forward. And it was obviously that it was God's will that Dr. Farrell keep on blazing the evangelist trail. Now, he may, he'll be the first one to tell you. He doesn't know how long he's going to do it. But he's also the first one to tell you he may see all of us gone, <laughs> and he'll still be going. So he's here as a tool of the Almighty to preach the Word until God says, I'm done with you. And uh, so we like to have a man like that. Thank you, Dr. Farrell, for being here. You're a blessing, and uh, we're anxious to hear what God has given to you for this evening for us. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Good Monday evening. Thank you so much for making your way to Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church to hear the mighty Word of God delivered, for you to receive it, to accept it, and to let God change your life. Tuesday night, Wednesday night, the meeting is history, but it's His story. And we want to pray that his story will be retold over and over and over again 
I hope that you've invited folks for tomorrow night and for Wednesday night. How many of you have some people coming tomorrow night? Anybody like that? Anybody's got some over here, over here, and over here? All right. How about Wednesday night? Who's got people coming Wednesday night? Let me see your hands. Good for you. God bless you. Bring them in under the sound of the word of the living God and let God change their lives. I'm enjoying being right here in this beautiful county. This is one of my favorite places in the United States. Now, I'm not just saying that to make you feel better. I just happen to like this place. Every time I come up through here, I think to myself, I just, I'm about to leave Florida and just move up here to Tennessee. But I really enjoy this place, and I'm so glad for all the ways that God has opened so many doors. And the fact that you're coming and putting this meeting top on your list, and we appreciate that so very, very much. Stand up, please, for the reading and teaching of the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And I'm going to start my reading, Pastor, down in verse 1, and I'm going all the way down to verse number 6. The Bible says in chapter 10 and verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I would beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with the confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we walk on two physical feet. We do not war after the flesh. That's an important part of the message that I'm bringing tonight. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I want to call your attention to verses 4 and 5. The weapons, notice plural, of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, sensual, but mighty, all-powerful through God to the pulling down, the smashing and destruction of the strongholds, casting down throwing down, permanently dismissing imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I'm preaching tonight on a, a simple two-title two, uh, message, sm a smashing strongholds. I hope you'll listen. I hope you'll let God speak to your heart. I hope you've come right now with a, a mind that says, Lord, whatever you tell me to do tonight, I'll do it. And if you'll do that, you'll see God's blessings on your life. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the word of the living God and the God of the living word. We thank you that they're both that which can give us eternal life. For anybody who's come to the Monday night service and has never been saved, draw them to yourself this very night. For those who name the name of Jesus, which is the vast majority in this room, I pray that you'll help us all to take our next spiritual step and to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. The Christian life is a warfare. That's repeatedly taught us that in the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 9, 26, I run so not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 1, 18, that thou mightest war a good warfare. It tells us also in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3 says, in your hardness is a good soldier, of Jesus Christ. And if you study carefully Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 down to the end of the chapter, you'll see all the pieces of the warfare. So we as God's soldiers can win in every fight that we get in. Yes, the Christian life is a warfare. Greatest mistake you'll ever make is to say, well, I got saved. I'm now in the comfort zone. No, sir, you're now in the combat zone. And that thing is going to rage 24-7. Satan is your enemy. 
1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a warring lion and walks about seeking whom he may devour. He doesn't need any help. He can handle you all by himself. But he sure does use wicked devices, including the uses of your own flesh. 1 Peter 2, 11, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust that war against your soul. He also uses the world. 1 John 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Let me encourage you to understand that Satan will use all kinds of things. But there's some things he cannot use because they don't belong to him. But he will use whatever of your flesh he can use. 1 Corinthians 3 and 16, know you not that you are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, what know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God? How is it that he's going to use what you have to come up against that which is coming against you 24-7? Well, the Bible tells us it's by influence. It's like a military metaphor. Somebody said the Marine's greatest weapon is his mind. I want to say that again. The Marine's greatest weapon is his mind. Because whoever controls your mind controls you. You don't want to give your mind to anybody except to the one who by his grace and his power can take you to the next level and allow you to understand the development of strongholds. So let's look at that tonight. How are strongholds developed? The very word stronghold comes from the term fortress, fortification, or to entrench. Somebody has called it a carnal castle, a fleshly fortress, towers and ramparts, things that Satan can use to come against you. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 24 and verse 9, the thought of foolishness is sin. Let me give you that again. The thought of foolishness is sin. Isaiah 26, 3, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee, for he trusteth in him. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue and any praise, think, reflect, meditate, chew on these things. Is that the kind of life that you live? In this passage of Scripture, he warns us of two things that Satan will use in your life. Number one, he wants to warn us of erroneous ideas. If you look down, you will see in the Bible it says, casting down, interesting word, imaginations, erroneous ideas, false reasoning. Anything that comes to your mind that is anti-God and anti-Scripture. How much of your day is spent meditating on things that have longevity to them? That which will last you all eternity. Or that which will come up and sneak up on you and lie to you. There's all kinds of terrible things that come to those of us who name the name of Jesus. One of them is the lie about salvation. The word save means delivered, to be rescued. How do you get delivered from your sin? Well, I think what you need to do is you need to go to church and get baptized. You'll be delivered from your sin. Who taught you that? That didn't come out of the Bible. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, I think if you join the church, you'll automatically be rid of sin. No, you'll have sin in church with you but you'll not be rid of it. Because wherever you choose to go, sin will go with you. But if you'll put your faith and trust in Christ and invite him to come live in your life, whosoever shall call, that's a key word, ask, invite, upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Others say somehow, I believe if I love Jesus more, he'll love me more. Where did you get that? The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us. Now watch me. And that while we were yet, come on, sinners, 
Not while we were yet good people, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we're saved from wrath through him. The question tonight is, are you allowing God to love you on his terms? Or are you trying to get him to love you on your terms? That's an important question. Because if you're in the place where you're trying to get him to love you on your terms, then you're not going to ever enjoy the things that he does for you. Some people don't understand the marital relationship. Well, let me explain to you how God loves you. God commends his love toward us. Don't miss this. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we're saved from wrath through him. God doesn't love you because of you. He loves you in spite of you. And everything he does for you, he does in spite of you. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable in all the bed and the foul, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. If you thought there was something that you could do to get him to love you more, you're dead wrong. Because he doesn't love you on the basis of what you do for him. He loves you on the basis of what he's done for you. Some people don't understand bitterness. You know, if I am just a nice guy and I forgive everybody and I don't hold any grudges, God will love me more. Where did you get that? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. We're to be very careful of any bitterness, lest it trouble you and thereby many be defiled. What happens is if you get bitterness in your life, you give Satan more opportunity to come up against you rather than less. Some other people say, well, if I'm just not angry, did God save you when you were not angry or when you were angry? Stop and think about that one. Most of us got saved at one time or another in our lives when we still had things going on that were not good. Had it not been for his love for us so that we could love him back we would not have been the kind of pure people we should be. Others are worried. You know, here's a crowd of people in this building tonight. Most of you are nice folks, and you smile, and you hold people at a distance, and everybody says, that guy's a real nice guy, but you go home and get ready to go to bed and lay in there in bed saying they don't know half of what goes on in my mind. And the truth of the matter is we don't. And you ought to be thankful we don't. And you ought to rejoice in the fact that the God who does know you, the moment you confess to him, takes your sin away. There are a lot of people that don't understand pornography. Well, uh, I just think if, if I can get rid of pornography, how would you do that? Do you think all of a sudden because we don't have any pornography, we would not have any porno sin in our minds? Most every man in this building and probably every woman at one time or another has seen pornography, either before or after you got saved. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 28, but I say unto you, whosoever shall look upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her in his heart already. You say, preacher, I know you're already in a conviction. I get that. Now, the question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to sit here tonight like you did last night and go home and say, well, I probably should have done something, but I didn't. That's up to you. But you're still going to have to deal with it, either here or hereafter. Let me say that again, either here or hereafter. You're going to have to deal with it. Don't wait for hereafter. No erroneous ideas. Number two, there's the high thing that exalts itself. The word high carries the idea of an independent thing. Egotistical independence. In other words, because we have been saved by the grace of God, we can kind of treat people the way we want because we'll get forgiven. Well, that's not always true because you're forgiven for what you confess. And for those of you that are missing this, 
you're missing the whole point of the message. Because you're not going to be forgiven until you confess, which means agree with God about the gravity of that sin. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are not just poor in spirit and have an attitude that needs to be helped, but blessed are those who actually come to God and say, I'm in desperate need of help because I have this area, that area, or multiple areas. I'm saying some of these things twice because I'm not sure everybody's getting it. Or multiple areas that all need to be confessed. Jesus said in John 15, 5, without me, ye can do. Which means if God is not first in your life and if he's not running your life and if he's not telling you to how to make decisions, then you have egotistical independence and you have that part of your life that is so strong that, it's, that I've called it erroneous ideas. And between those two things, they will move in and take over. And if you do not give yourself fully and totally to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you're going to spend most of your life empty. Number two, what are strongholds? How are they detected? How would you know if you have one? Well, I found two ways to know if you got a stronghold. Number one, is it that which you do habitually? Now, when I say do something habitually, I don't mean that you always do that. You don't do it every hour or every 30 minutes, but probably once or twice a day it comes up. Sometimes if you're having a bad day and didn't spend any time in the Word and just got up and got yourself ready and took off and went to work, all of that stuff gangs up on you. Now, you can run down here to the church house and find your pew and get on your knees and confess your sin and go back and get in the car and go back to work if you want to. But by the time you get back to work, you'll probably have to turn around and come back here and do that again. That's the way our bodies work. It's the way we're moved. And you're going to have to decide whether you want to be a winner or a loser. And you'll never be a winner by allowing that which is habitual in your life. Second of all, is it, do you view it hopelessly? You ever say, well, this is kind of like I've got a uh, rod up my back. It's, it's kind of like the saddle that I've got on is just so tight I can't get it right. It's, it just seems like I'm always hopelessly viewing these things. Thank God for some missionaries and some evangelists and some pastors and all of them in case you're wondering have these hopeless and helpless situations. All of them. You say, preacher, are you t I'm telling you I have them just like you have them. And the question is whether or not you're going to deal with them and let God help you to overcome them or if you're going to argue and allow Satan to take charge in your life. Number three, how are strongholds destroyed? This is the part of the message you ought to like. You see, most of the time a guy get up and he'll tell you something you're doing wrong and when you leave, you don't know how to do it right. I taught preaching for years and years and still teach it in some places and I told him, I said, if you tell everybody what they're doing wrong and you don't tell them how to do it right, you haven't preached, you've abused your crowd. Because for every problem in the Scripture, there is a biblical answer. Let me say it again. For every problem in the Scripture, there is a biblical answer. And if you found yourself just getting beat up, you're allowing that which is being coming at you to conquer you rather than conquer it. Romans 8, 37, nay, and more, all these things, we are more than conquerors. Now, if you miss that verse... I can give you the rest of this message, but you're not going to understand it. Because until you come to the place where you say, I'm not going to allow sin to have its place in my body any longer. It may give me a right to argue with God, but I will know as soon as I argue with God that he's right and I'm wrong and I'll just have to get back on my knees and allow him to forgive me and work in through by and for my life. So how do you do that? 
Well, number one, you admit. You admit the stronghold. It says you're to cast it down and pull it down. It means to tear it down, to destroy it. Because if it stays alive and well in your life, you will be miserable all of your life. Oh, you can get used to it. And then you'll do something a little worse than you did before. Proverbs 28, 13, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Notice confess, that means agree with God and forsake them. It means turn away from everything that is offending him. By the way, you can quote that verse and never use that verse and spend the rest of your, your life on planet earth in misery. Because you don't get the power to overcome sin until you admit you have it. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, our sins, not your friend's sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the first thing is you must admit the stronghold. Number two, you must arm against the stronghold. The Bible says we have weapons, multiple weapons. I'm only going to show you three. Take your Bible and go to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, and turn with me to chapter number six of the book of Ephesians. And when you get to chapter six, you know that this has to do in verses 10 all the way down to the end of chapter with the armor of the man or woman of God. Weapons, all powerful armor. I want to skip my reading all the way down to verse 16. Above all, 616, taking the shield of faith wherewith we may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now watch verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, watch this, which is the word of God. Step number one is getting the Word of God so it can be used on a regular daily basis. If you're one of those that gets the Word of God every Sunday and it's good for you for about half a day and that's all you can do for a solid week, I feel bad for you. I'm not trying to be unkind to you. I'm just telling you I feel bad for you. Because you're not winning, you're losing. God gave you something to take with you 24-7. To bed, when you get up, whatever you're involved in, he gives you the word of God to come against it. The word, word of God can either be logos, which means the entirety of scripture, or can be rhema, R-H-E-M-A. Rhema is a word from the word. You say, well, preacher, what happened to you when you gave your life to the Lord at age 17? I had some work to do. And for those of you that are sitting looking at me saying, I never did have any work to do. You're in trouble tonight. I'm not trying to be cute. I'm just telling you, you're in trouble tonight. Because until you admit that you have a lot of needs, you're not going to get any help. One of the needs that I had as a born again, wandering, wicked teenager was with a tongue. I'm on a guess tonight, most everybody at one time or another has had trouble with your tongue. And I'm not, I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand because I've got it. I know what it's like. Psalm 17, 2 and 3, Psalm 19, 14, Psalm 141, 3, James chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Every one of those verses has to do with the tongue. Every one of them. And if you'll have stocked those up and shoot them from the revolver of your life, you will have a winning, an opportunity. One of the second things that got me was my thoughts. I realize that some of you are sitting here tonight saying, I don't think I have any trouble with my thoughts. Well, I think I already named one of them with you and probably the woman that you might think about who's not married to you. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee also youthful lust. 
1 Peter 2.11, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. Preacher, where do you get this? It comes to me from Matthew chapter 4. You may remember the Lord Jesus Christ has an opportunity to sin after he spent 40 days fasting. Satan comes up and he sits on the temple mount and he says, uh, why don't you make these pieces of stone into bread? Jesus answered, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well, come over here to the temple and cast yourself off because he'll restore and take care of everybody that does that. Jesus said he may, but he won't take care of me because I belong to him. Come over here and spend a little time worshiping me. And I'll give you all of these things that you've seen with your eyes. No, I'm not going to worship you. I'm worshiping my heavenly Father. And pretty soon, all those three major temptations are gone. You know why? Because Jesus didn't come saying, guess who I am? You don't tempt me. There's nothing you have that I want. Oh, there was plenty he had that Jesus wanted. But he was not about to surrender his will to the will of Satan and end up in a mess. So the question I'm asking you tonight, what are you doing with the Word of God? Go down to verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and a supplication in the Spirit. The second weapon that you have is the word prayer. It literally means to ask God for something. In a position where you are letting Him know that He can and you can't. Let me say that again. In a position where you're letting him know that he can and you can't. And until you get that position, why would he answer you? Because you go by and tip your hat and say, it'd be nice if you just stop by and give me a hand every now and then. He don't plan to give you a hand on that. But if you'll come broken. This happened uh, when I was a young man. I got involved in some pornography and Thank God it's under the blood. No, oh, by the way, every sin that you commit can go under the blood. And if it comes up again, you can confess it again. And it goes back under the blood. But if you don't confess it, you still got it. And I may be talking to some people here tonight, and you've got quite a few of them. Quite a few of them that you won't deal with. Because you're allowing yourself the opportunity to make those things which come around you destroy you. Take your Bible and go please to the book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. We have seen tonight that you have to understand the teaching of the Bible. You go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and I'll show you the third and final thing that helps you overcome whatever you're facing. It's the word praise. Psalm 22 and verse 3, Thou art, thou inhabitest the courts of the praise of Israel. Psalm 100 and verse 4, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. If you want God to hear you, then look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And let me read to you a few verses of Scripture. There's an invasion going on of Judah. The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 20, It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and them with the other side of the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Verse 3, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to help to ask help of the Lord, even out of all the cities of Judah. And they came to seek the Lord. Go to verse 16. Tomorrow go ye down against them, and behold, they will come up with the cliff of Zire. And ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeru. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, see the salvation of the Lord. O Judah, the word means praise, and Jerusalem, the word means to fear. Fear not, nor be dismayed. 
Tomorrow go against them, for the Lord will be with you. If you go down to the latter part of verse 19, they stood up to praise the Lord of Israel with a loud voice. If you go down to the latter part of verse 20, believe in the Lord your God, so he shall be established, and believe his prophets, so shall he prosper. Verse 21, and when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of his holiness, and went out before the army to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now watch verse 22. And when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. Now for some of you, I left you about 20 minutes ago. I'm not trying to be unkind. I just read faces. When all of a sudden I got people asleep and checking their socks and other things, that's all right. But for those of you that really want this and will obey this, when you use the Word of God against the lies Satan's been giving you, when you come to him and you tell him, I have got to have you, I'm depending upon you, and when you begin to praise him for all that he has done and can do, you're on the winning team. Take your Bible in closing and go to the book of Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Look down please at verse 11. I want to go back to verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and the strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. That's his position. Which accused them before our God day and night. That's what happened after he was cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. The blood of the Lamb, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And by the word of their testimony. Somebody said, Preacher, what is that? It's this. I'm saved by the grace of God. And with His blood and His grace that's taken away my sin, when I sin against Him in any shape, form, or fashion... The moment I confess it, it's gone. I never have to meet it again. And for some of you, I need to say a word to you tonight about your attitude concerning past sins that happened 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Those sins, if you confess them, are gone. I said, maybe you didn't say, man, because you don't understand what I just finished saying. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us, release us, let us go from our sin. So if God has released you from your sin, why in the world are you doubling up on it so that it's more and more and more and more when God wants you to be released from everything that has been confessed? Now it's going to be important for me to explain something to you and that is this. What you don't confess and what you don't give to God stacks up against you. When I was in high school, I was not right with God until my senior year, the summer before my senior year, I gave my life to the Lord. And I heard that downtown in my hometown in Greensboro, North Carolina, they were going to bombard the King Cotton Hotel. This was back in the 60s. Many of you were not even here in the 60s, but I still can remember it. I went down and took a look. You say, how did you go down in a school day? Don't ask that question. But I went. And I stood there and I counted off the last five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Boom! And the whole thing came to the ground. I've often thought, if the people that were the low life that lived in that place didn't believe what the mayor had said, didn't believe what the city council could do, if they were at an opposite angle from our United States government, how many of them would have gone to hell? 
We don't believe he's going to. But they did. And it's never been back up since. I could take you downtown and show you where it used to be. Oh, there's another big building there. But it's not the King Cotton Hotel. There'll never be another King Cotton Hotel there. Because when the mayor said, we're going to mow it down, they mowed it down. Everybody that believed what the mayor said he was going to do got out of that building. Preacher, do you know if anybody did not? No, I don't. But I can tell you this. Those of you tonight who get up and walk out this door and head to your car and do not obey this message are foolish. That's the best way I can, that's the nicest thing I can say to you. Because when a man of God tells you exactly what God says and you don't have enough common sense to believe what God's man said and you can just take the word of God and close it up and go to home and live your life the way you want to, you're a fool. And I don't want you to be a fool. And most of you sitting in this building tonight don't want to be a fool. And I hate to tell you that there's some of you in this building that have been a fool for a long time. So the question is, what are you going to do with the strongholds in your life that were placed there with your permission at the bidding of Satan? Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, we thank you for the word of God. It'll never change, but it can change us. Would you do that tonight? How many of you bowed before the Lord could say with your Bible beside your face, I don't think I'm going to heaven. I don't hope I'm going to heaven. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt I'm on my way to heaven. No doubt about it. I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. If that's true about you and there's no doubt about it, would you raise your hand real high? That's me. That's me. God bless you. Take it down. I wonder if there's somebody here tonight and you'd say, Preacher, I just don't know if I'm saved or not. I'm not sure if I belong to Jesus or not, but I know this. If a person can know they're going to heaven, if a person can understand for certain that if you repent, change your mind, if you put all of your confidence in Christ, that he's God, died for me, was buried for me, raised again for me, and is offering me the gift of eternal life and I receive it, I can be saved tonight. I would like that. I don't know that, but I'd like to know that. If you're like that tonight and you'd say, Dr. Farrell, please pray for me. I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven, but I'd really like to know. Please pray for me. Would you raise your hand? Just hold it straight up. I'll look for it. Anywhere in the building. I don't know, but I'd sure like to know. I'd like to be certain, no doubt about it. Lord, again tonight, nobody has raised their hand to say I'm lost. Thank you that I can pray now for your people. We're bowed before the Lord. I want you to listen carefully to the question I'm asking you. If you took the last six months of your life I'm not saying did you not have a stronghold. I'm asking you, did you confess it? I'm not asking you, did you confess it once and it came back four or five times and you said, I'm not going to confess it again. No, no. If you don't confess it every time it comes, it's still there. I'll say that again. If you don't confess it every time it comes, it's still there. So how many of you could say in the last six months of my life, as far as I know, God being my witness, there is no stronghold in my life at all? Now stop before you raise your hand. Ask God if that's true. If it is true, and you can say it's true, would you raise your hand to the God who knows it's true? Just leave it there. All right, take it down. Now look right up here, would you? Y'all make it easy to preach. I looked around tonight. There's a few more tonight than there was last night, but not that many. You're carrying things with you. 
What I'm trying to do is to help you to dump them in the lap of Jesus Christ. Because the only person that can forgive your sin is Jesus. Nobody else can forgive your sin. Or can they forgive if you curse them? Yeah, if you'll ask them. If you steal from them? Yeah, if you'll ask them. But let me say to you, if you don't confess your stealing to God and confess your covetousness to God, you're still not forgiven. Some of you didn't get that. If you don't confess your stealing and covetousness and lying and all these other things to God, you're still not forgiven. Let's bow our heads together. As we're bowed before the Lord, how many of you would say tonight God spoke to my heart? I can't argue with him. I can't shake my fist at him. I can't get upset with him. He's trying to help me. He's trying to get rid of this stuff in my life. He wants me to have freedom. He doesn't want me to be under the bondage of sin. And I'm sick of this sin. And I want God's forgiveness. Please pray for me. If that's you and you're tired of your sin, and you want to be forgiven. And I don't know how many it is or how many different kinds it is, but you want to be forgiven. Right now, please, raise your hand as high as you can raise it. Just hold it straight up in the air. Just as high as you can raise it. Just leave it there for just a minute. Just leave it there for just a minute. Now, Father, we're going to play one verse of Just As I Am. Pastor's coming. He'll be here to pray with anybody, encourage anybody, be a blessing to anybody. But there's some rebellion in this room tonight. And some of these people need to hear that word rebellion. And they need to understand because they will not confess, they are not forgiven. But we're going to accept all those tonight who said, I want to be right with God. And those that don't want to be right with God are going to go home unforgiven. The pastor's coming to stand in front of this platform. The pianist is going to play one stanza of Just As I Am. We're all going to hum it together. But if God's spoken to you, you need to leave your seat and come right now from across this building to make your peace with God. You come as she plays. that you would bless the folks tonight and Lord may each and every one of us walk dear Lord in the way that we should walk Lord we understand that when we're saved all of our sins are put on the account of Jesus Christ we never pay for those Lord tonight a message was preached about having good fellowship with you after we're saved and how the way that we live can prevent that fellowship and ruin that. And Lord, that's no way for a Christian to live with unconfessed sin in their life. And so I pray, dear Lord, that we would walk in the way that was described tonight and walk in that way gladly where we would, Lord, keep ourselves right with you and those strongholds that come that we would confess them to you and Lord, walk in the way that you would have us to walk. I pray that you'd bless it to be true in every Christian life in this room tonight. And I pray, dear Lord, that you would bless it to be true with us as a church collectively as well. Lord, we'll thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may look this way. Well, thank you again for being in church tonight. And it has been a joy to get to be together again. And uh, thank the Lord when you go kick, pick up your children, your young people. Make sure you thank those folks that are in there. 
it's a joy to serve the Lord over there. Some of my family's over there helping with the kids. And um, it's a joy when folks will serve in that way so that this can go on. And so we all need to come together and remember that it's, a, it's just a blessing to get to serve the Lord. And thank those that, I thank those, and be sure you do, that uh, came early. We're here today and getting the food ready and all that's gone on. What a wonderful day. So speaking of the food, uh, after the service, there will, uh, they're going to be serving the walking tacos. And if you want to make your way through there and get something in fellowship for a while, if you need to make your way through there and get it and go, either way is just fine. But I hope that you say good night to a few people before you leave and fellowship a little bit together. God bless you. Thank you for being in church tonight. We'll see you tomorrow night. Don't forget, 5.30-ish, we'll start eating. You can come in. Have some a loaded baked potato or whatever you want to put on there. And then we'll come right in here for the preaching of God's Word. God bless you. You're dismissed. Whose was stripes and bright stars?